Glad to be here with y'all today. Um, I generally only take um, uh, events in warm weather um, uh, in the month of January, and y'all kind of cheated me a little bit, so I need somebody to get on that job. You know, um, I'm reminded of the story of Johnny and James with two brothers. Uh, they had a tradition where their mom, every Saturday, would uh, cook them um, breakfast. They would do a pancake dinner. And um, the rule of the house that the mother uh, put was that whatever week it was, the previous week, uh, the person that gets the key, the brother that gets the pancakes the first, uh, uh, gets the first pancakes was the other one that didn't get it the last week. And so Johnny and James were actually like arguing and trying to figure out, uh, um, is this, uh, uh, this is my week because you got pancakes first last week. And then James said, uh, um, no, I, you got pancakes first last week. It's my turn this week. And, you know, like mothers, it's just you hear a lot of bickering and, and you just try to get it done as soon as possible. But what she said, this is a teachable moment. What I'm going to do is try to disciple them. And so she says, well, Johnny, if you want to be like Jesus, what you would do is you would um, let James get his pancakes first. And so, uh, or, or, and so then J James says, yeah, Johnny, how about you be Jesus first? <laughs> when we talk about uh, uh, division and reconciliation and peacemaking, we oftentimes want our other brother and sister to be Jesus first. So whether you're a conservative Christian or a progressive Christian, or even you consider yourself a reasonable Christian, I want you to look to see how you could be like Jesus first, okay? So the word Arabi means a foretaste of things to come. And what we believe is that the church ought to be a foretaste of what heaven is like. The way that it's said in the book of Ephesians is that the spirit was given to the church so that we get a foretaste of what heaven is like. But see, the world doesn't get the, whole, the, get the Holy Spirit. What the world gets is the church. And so it's a trial before you buy. And so a lot of people don't really want to go to heaven with us because they don't like being with us now. <laughs> and so we need to figure this out where if you're talking with your colleagues or your neighbors and they say, you know, what is heaven like? Um, it's just these like naked babies playing the harp. You say, no, 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 no. Why don't you come to my community and see people of different political backgrounds, people of different socioeconomic backgrounds, people of different cultural backgrounds living together and as community. Now, here's something I want to make really, really clear. There is a difference between the word diversity and reconciliation. So you can have a diverse community for a lot of different reasons, but there might not necessarily be the work of reconciliation going on. And when I use the word reconciliation, I am not talking about what we call racial reconciliation, which is often a way of kind of making a surface level atonement for the sins of the past. What I'm using the word reconciliation is acknowledging as Christians that the world is broken and it is systemically broken. It's sociologically broken. It's relationally broken. And so we as Christians are acknowledging that reality, but Christ is in the work of reconciling all things. And so for the Christian, the question isn't whether or not the world is broken. It's really more so what are the details and how is Christ inviting us to partner in the work of reconciliation? So a diverse community doesn't guarantee reconciliation. What a diverse community guarantees is conflict. And we need conflict resolution skills. We need to have a theology and practice of reconciliation. And so every Christian community may or may not be a diverse community, but every Christian community ought to be a reconciling community. So as you're looking for the opportunity in my talk of how can you be like Jesus, is the question that you maybe want to think about is how can we become more of a reconciling community in the places that you have influence to be a foretaste of the things to come? Now, if you have seen the news any time in the last five years, you know, 
uh, or even if you paid attention to what's been going on in Virginia, there's a lot of need for the work of reconciliation. You know, uh, there's a social critic that um, had a very profound insight. He says, but the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, uh, be forfeited uh, by the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. Does anybody know who said this? Has anybody seen this by show of hands as a, a, a true statement? All right, guys, I come from the Black Pentecostal tradition, so, so speaking and preaching isn't a monologue, it's a dialogue. So you got to <laughs> give me some feedback. It helps me be a little shorter. All right. So this was Dr. King, what he said in 1963, letter for the Birmingham jail. This is so true. You would have thought that it was said yesterday, but it was actually said over 55 years ago. So when King is talking about this early church, what is he talking about? Like when we look at the scriptures, we see that somehow people's encounter with the king meant something for the kingdom of God coming down on earth. And what they were doing, and this is something that King talks about in this in, in, in a letter from Birmingham jail. He says there's probably going to have to be a church within a church. What I mean is an ecclesia. This is somebody that sees it's not about just gathering of people or being a congregation, but somehow being a government official, a governing body that is uh, uh, on behalf of the kingdom of God, bringing God's kingdom to earth as agents. And so when we gather, we're almost gathering as uh, uh, kingdom officials that's trying to get a foretaste of heaven to come in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our country, and in our world. Can I get an amen? So I, I want you to look through that lens because, you know, I grew up in a Pentecostal background. And, you know, one thing, if you don't know a whole lot about Pentecostals, what we like is holiness. We talk about holiness all the time. And holiness is a word that means to be set apart. And we spent a lot of time in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians has a lot of spiritual power. It has a lot of talk about holiness and righteousness. And this was a text in which I uh, oftentimes heard, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, songs in the Spirit, from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the thoughts that I will be gathering with you all today is the thoughts of worshiping woke. See, he says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. See, in the first part of the text, he's saying, be cautious, Know that we live in an evil world and see in my Pentecostal background, we always talked about the evil that was on inside of us and we would call that the flesh. We were very aware of what we call the flesh. And because we're also Pentecostal, we were also worried about the evil on the outside and we call that the world. And we knew that there were things about the world on the outside that can resonate with the evil on the inside, which we call the flesh. But one of the things that my Pentecostal background didn't give us was the gift of understanding how to understand the evil of the systems of the world. 
See, when you look at the book of Ephesians, and if you remember Paul when he was in Acts, when he came from Corinthians to Ephesians, he was uh, um, spending some time at Tyrannus' Hall because he got kicked out of the local church. He was uh, a guy that was making a an ecclesia because he got kind of kicked out of the old religious system. And so he was making some disciples with pe- those who were willing and was preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And then the spirit began to work inside of his life and people were getting healed and delivered. And then the need for the principalities of that period of time in Ephesus, which was the uh, uh, capital of the goddess Diana, and and, and they uh, uh, began to get disturbed and, and, and it messed up the economy of the local economy. So then it caused a riot. And so it's in this context, he was dealing with the systems that were going on in this time. And, 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 you know, my church context had a vision for holiness and being set apart that was about the inside and outside, but not necessarily about the systems. And when I look around, many of us in the evangelical space aren't really knowing how to be wise in that space. It says, be careful and be wise so that you aren't ignorant and foolish and so that you can understand what the will of the Lord is. As I've been on this journey of understanding reconciliation, uh, I've been understanding, just trying to understand what is the level of brokenness that's going on. This is really fascinating because I learned about this guy named, um, oh, before I jump into that. Yeah, here we go. I remember this guy, here we go, Harlan Bartholomew. Harlan Bartholomew is uh, the guy who created our whole systems of our cities. He designed every single, like like the 400 cities uh, um, during the period of time of like the 1930s, 40s, 50s, he set the blueprint of this. And this was the blueprint plan. Now, it's important to understand what was the, the number one priority of no, the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. It was so that I don't have children, but if I did, it would be that my black son would not go to school with your white daughter and they would fall in love and have babies and children together. And so he designed cities in a way that would be a third industrial zoning, a third highways, and a third public housing. And do you know what his first city was? St. Louis. Remember Ferguson? And so there's an a, 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 a organizational guru by the name of Peter Drucker that basically says there's no such thing as a broken system. Systems are, are, are getting the results that they're designed for. And so when we look at the kind of systems that have been going on, when this guy uh, uh, um, influenced 400 of our cities, and if you look at any city that you live in, look to see how the city is set up, where there's a white section, there's a kind of maybe immigrant section, a black section, and maybe a mixed section. And you can tell the uh, economy what is the best zone by the zip code, which is the best schools, by how white this place is. And so what also began to happen was the FHA and uh, VA loans began to pour out into these particular spaces. And so your access to capital to uh, make your house good and uh, to, 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 to uh, improve it or to start a business or to take like equity out of your house to start a business or maybe to pay for your child's education all happened because you had access to capital. And the reason we had access to capital is because the all white zone would get a, a kind of an A zone and then the, 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 the uh, maybe mixed one would be a B. And if it was even a strongly black middle class area, maybe get a C. And if it was a poor area, it would get a D or an F rating. And so this became a law that you could discriminate across this until 1968. See, that is 51 years ago. And so the cities were designed in this way where they said, hey, we'll get access and loans and property and all that kind of stuff in this type of way. So this is kind of why when you look at the Pew Research, 
the wealth of white brothers and sisters, uh, the medium space is uh, 114,000 to the 11,000 of black or to the college educated, 300,000 uh, wealth to 26,000 or there's 72% ownership in white communities versus 43% in black uh, communities and $71,000 annually or uh, of, of income to 43. And if you're college educated, it's 100 to about 82. And, and see, the scriptures is telling us we shouldn't be ignorant of these things because we should learn how to worship woke. And here's why we shouldn't be ignorant, because what's interesting is that the spirit also happens to, to, to has been leading church planners over the last 30 to 40 years to plant churches in economic sustainable places that tend to fall within these racialized fault lines. So we left the city, went to the suburbs, planted in the same places that works well for like Jared's and Chick-fil-A, and that's where the spirit led us. And then now because of the kids are moving back to the cities, um, they are now we're going through, like the church is a tripwire for gentrification and it's really accelerating this and folks are being displayed, uh, displaced. And why is this? Is because over the last 30 to 40 years, we have been planting churches off the homogenous unit principle. Meaning we need to find people that uh, look like us, that are like us, that maybe have the same desire in music, the same desire in preaching, the same desire in children. And we need to make sure they're in like 70 to 80, maybe $100,000 income bracket. And this is important because we need to be good stewards of our resources. So we'll do the missions project for the hood and we'll do the church planning for the money. Now, I'm, nobody says it that plain, but if you look over the last 30, 40 years, that's what's happened. So this is what happens when we begin to plant our churches and develop our churches and, 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 and define success by how big the buildings are, how many butts and seats, and how big is the budget. So when we talk about diversity and reconciliation, it's off of this narrative of uh, how many people can assimilate where well, we want different colors but not different cultures. We want different, uh, 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 um, different colors but not different mindsets. And when there's a conflict, it's about uh, uh, not, not about true reconciliation of the fault lines of what's broken in our world. It's about re relieving the tension that is going on. Now, people might ask you, David, why are you still Pentecostal? because I read this stuff all the time, and I believe in the work of the Spirit. It says, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. See, it's not just enough to be cautious or even to be woke with knowledge, but we need to be wise. What do you do? How do you apply that knowledge? Like, wisdom is having knowledge and knowing what to do with that knowledge. So we live in this broken world, and so the more that we know, the more that we're implicated. And I think it's important for us to understand that a lot of us don't want to know these things because then we'll end up being responsible to do something for it. But if Christians don't know this information, when we got the Spirit of God in us, when we are people of the resurrection, uh, if, the, if, the, if the world only sees and will, are the only ones that will say how truthful the death of sin is, but then we don't want to admit how truthful the death of sin is uh, in our own country and context, then we also, as people who have the solutions, don't have the ability to give people the solutions to these massive, deep spiritual problems. So we as Christians, in order to become a reconciled community, have to understand the depth of the problem and be uh, uh, get some knowledge so that we can be woke, so that we won't be a part of the problem, but we can become part of the solution. So this raises the question, what do we do? We need to be cautious, be wise, and be discerning of God's will. 
See, the metaphor of reconciliation that I love is, is kind of as like a puzzle piece. All these different things are broken up. And there is a picture of shalom that we see in Revelation 21, where it says, I see a new heaven and a new earth. All things have passed away. The old, old order of things have uh, uh, come and, and that uh, there's no need for crying and weeping and the old order of things uh, um, has, has come into existence. And, 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 and that's what we're going after. We're going after a time where there isn't a, a, a need to uh, uh, cry and weep and mourn. But right now, we are in a time where we need to cry and weep and mourn. And because we have uh, kind of developed a, a church model that is successful off the homogenous unit principle of kind of wealthy uh, folks, there isn't a language for lament. Every week you come in and, you know, if you look at the liturgy, Jesus came back, everything's great until we go to uh, heaven, which is America 2.0. <laughs> and everybody doesn't get that. Everybody doesn't get that same experience. And what happens is because I've pastored in wealthy churches and, and, and I realized that there's a lot of brothers and sisters that are hurting that actually would need some songs of lament. And then when we deal with some kind of like major societal crisis, we can't talk about it in the four walls of our church, even though there are people in your pews that are hurting about this uh, um, because of the fact that, that uh, 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 we, we have fed people a diet of happy clappy. And so then when, when, when there is something truly significant to lament, there isn't a language or a lexicon to be able to deal with what's going on outside of the walls of the church or even inside the walls of the church. So, you know, it says, don't be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. See, I grew up Pentecostal, so Pentecostals don't drink. Then I worked for this Southern Baptist church and I realized that Southern Baptists don't drink in public. Amen. <laughs> then I began to do a lot of ecumenical stuff and I realized you Episcopalians, Lord Jesus. So, you know, <laughs> but contrary to my Pentecostal background, they say that wine is uh, 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 wine in itself isn't bad, but it's actually a good thing that's being abused. And so, what the text is reminding us is like, don't take the good thing and like abuse it. And see, it's important for us to understand that there are things that we could get drunk not only off of wine, but we can get drunk off of a lot of good things. And one of the good things that we can get drunk off is power. If you want to know what that looks like, turn your TV on, okay? But you also, and we also can get drunk off of privilege. The ability to be able to disconnect from something. Because we are at a conference on, um, at a seminary, all of us have a temptation to be intoxicated with privilege. This isn't just um, a, a ethnic thing or a cultural thing or a racial thing. This is a class thing, this is an education thing. The fact that we could be here having this kind of scholarly conversation means that this is a significant potential for temptation um, with us. And so what Paul says to us is that instead of uh, um, being drunk with wine or power or privilege, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's important for us to understand that this particular aspect of the text is an incarnational text. See, the Spirit is at work in the body. The Spirit is at work that the songs that we sing that are coming out of one another is coming out of an embodied context. See, one of the things that's a gift to the Christian publishing industry is that we could sing Amazing Grace. We can sing uh, uh, How Great Is Our God, or uh, we could sing uh, uh, 10,000 Reasons. But what the challenge of this is, is that it's kind of 
uh, uh, um, help to it's, it's, it's create a situation where there's so much of generalization that we don't have the particularization that this particular text is talking about. See, the spirit working at your church is going to be different than what the spirit is doing out at my church. And the people, like the song that you would write is going to be very different than the song that I would write. And I need to hear your laments and I need to hear your praises. I need to hear what you're mourning and I need to hear what you are celebrating. And, and, and we need to exchange that with one another and these different types of variety, uh, um, not just so that we can like celebrate diversity for diversity's sake, but it will give us the tools for what we need to live in this perilous and broken context. Now, one question that we have to look at is that some of us know our songs on both sides. Like, so, so let's say it this way. People of color tend to know white people's songs, but white people don't tend to know people of color songs. And we got to ask ourselves why. Why is that? Well, if you remember Brown versus the Board of Education, there was this um, uh, test where they put a, a white doll baby and a black doll baby in front of um, these black children. And they asked the children, they said, hey, which, which, which doll baby is smarter? They said, the white doll baby. Which doll baby is uh, 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 prettier? The white doll baby. Which one is better? The white doll baby. They asked the same question, which, which one is dumber? The black doll baby. Which one is uh, uh, um, uh, um, uglier? The black doll baby. Which one is worse? The black doll baby. When they, just to make sure the kids understood who they are, who they were, they asked the question, they said, which one are you? And the kids knew that they were the black doll baby. What this teaches us is that you don't have to have white skin in order to have a white supremacist mindset. What you have to do is be shaped by our country. When you go to school, you learn about the history of the white dog baby and all the successes of the white dog baby. When you look on TV, you see a comprehensive view of the white dog. Baby. Even the villains are smart villains that have a lot of complexity to it. And you see the heroes are going to be generally white heroes and everybody else is going to be a stereotype. The Asian people, even though Asian people have been here for hundreds of years, they still are perpetual foreigners. Uh, even though the Hispanic folks, there are more people than gardeners and gangsters, they are still going to be those stereotypes and the black people are going to have their own stereotypes. And, and, and you learn a lot more about the white doll baby and we have internalized that the white doll baby is normative and is particular, particularly better. So what do we do with that? We have to worship woke and realize that our broken world has shaped us in this way. So what does reimagining worship look like? I was part of a, I've been a part of a Christian community over the last 10, 12 years that's just tried to say like, hey, let's not be afraid to look at the brokenness that's going on. And let's, uh, uh, um, we know that there's an intersection between worship and mission. So let's, let's, let's try to see how we're being formed and shaped and realizing that the world is forming us in a very, very hard and difficult, racialized and ec economically uh, challenging uh, way. The thesis in which our ministry operates under, and again, I'm going to make a distinction between white people and the spirit of white supremacy. There's a clear distinction, because again, I said, you don't have to have white skin to have a white supremacist mindset. But to realize it is a spiritual principality that was manifested economically, legislated politically, and affects us relationally, gives us the tools to begin to understand how we could properly do the work of reconciliation. This is peculiar to what's going on in the United States and it's been exported around the world globally. So I realized that 10, 10 years ago that our community didn't have the tools to deal with this level of brokenness. I realized that there was a disconnect that King was talking about in our community context. We had two young men that were from off the street and Black Lives Matter wasn't a hashtag, but I realized when we were singing the Christ alone that this wasn't the, the content, even if I put a, a hip hop beat on, on in Christ alone, it wasn't going to speak to the pastoral issues of what these brothers were dealing with. 
didn't have the 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 the, the song content. I also looked at our church. We had two Kevin Joneses in our church. One Kevin Jones was a um, economist. Another one was a, a brother that was homeless, that experienced homelessness for a greater part of his adult life. That Kevin Jones experienced homelessness for the greater part of his, his adult life would always uh, sit, stand in the back and would come um, at the end of the service to eat meals together. He was a very active part of our church, but in the worship context, he said, hey, uh, uh, um, I was like, why, why? I was asking the Spirit, why doesn't he ever come and sit down and participate everywhere where the other Kevin Jones, who was an economist, he would sit and engage wherever he wanted to with him and his family. And the Spirit said, David, when you preach, when you uh, prepare worship, uh, uh, which Kevin Jones are you preparing for? See, the one that experienced homelessness was African-American, but the one that was an economist has the same kind of educational and, and station and economic status in life. And so I realized that we had to do something about this. So I realized we had a problem not only with our preaching, but our worship formation, our leadership development, and decided to create this internship where I would get young people between the ages of 18 to 25 to try to build a system where we're developing leaders, uh, uh, but particularly minority leaders who could engage in the work of reconciliation, but also give white brothers and sisters the opportunity to become a minority and to learn how to uh, 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 be equipped for this type of work. We would teach them how to study justice and reconciliation and be cultural anthropologists and, and study theology. And instead of writing papers, what they do is they would write worship songs. And this became the language that we used in our community. This became the songs that we would sing in our church. And this is what urban doxology came out of. And as I close, there was this um, summer where Trayvon Martin was going on, and this was not a political issue. To quote Sandra Van Opstel, she says that um, one thing that's a political issue for one people group is a pastoral concern for another people group. And this was a significant pastoral concern for us. And so that Saturday night, the verdict came out, and that Sunday morning, I was so glad that I wasn't the preacher that day. But what our interns did was they wrote this song, a song of lament, just out of the anguish of what was going on that week uh, uh, and, and, and going on that summer. And the preacher preached. It was a pretty decent message. We sung the song, and then there was a moment of silence. And at the end of the song, we wept and cried together. We were being the ecclesia together. We were getting a foretaste of what heaven is like when people will be present in the presence of God together and there will be no more need for mourning or crying or weeping. So even as I give this gift, this is the type of stuff that could be worshiping woke where we could have formational worship that's getting us beyond the four walls of the church. And because of the heaviness of this topic, what I'm going to do is just play the song as you allow the spirit to speak to you to listen, to see maybe how could you be more like Jesus in becoming, helping your community become more of a reconciling community.